Hi, this is James Cook, Assistant Professor of Sociology at the University of Maine at Augusta, and I am speaking to you from my home today because we've had a snow day up here in Maine, and uh, I'm supposed to be speaking to uh, Introduction to Sociology students in person, but that's impossible. So I want to uh, communicate remotely a little bit, and I'd like to talk today about culture culture and society. How do we think about society and what do we think about this thing called culture? We've all heard the word culture. What does it mean? How is it distinct from a society? So when we've talked about society in this class, we've talked about building blocks of either individuals in interaction or classes of people, economic classes, gender classes, racial classes of people uh, in conflict on the, on the basis of competing interests. Um, or we've thought about institutions. Um, we will also be thinking about groups and networks, uh, building structures of belonging and communicating. Uh, but when institutions uh, occur, when classes occur, when there are networks of people interacting uh, or groups of people getting together uh, based around a common something. What is that common something? A common meaning. What do people spread? Meaning, uh, a sense of belonging, uh, a piece of information, a value, a belief, a way of doing things and a demonstration that we are different from them. The thing that is spread through institutions, through within classes uh, and in networks of interaction and in groups, that thing that's spread, that stuff, that content that it spreads through structure is culture. The structure itself is society and the stuff of society the content is its culture so what makes up culture well, a lot of things but there are uh, four basic ideas that uh, culture is a set of beliefs about things we think are true Values, things that we believe to be good, proper, just, right, the things that are just right. Uh, this is a moral sense, which is different than a sense of being. Uh, for instance, we believe that in our culture that uh, after you've eaten, you shouldn't go swimming for a half an hour because you'll get a cramp. Well, that's not necessarily true. Um, we believe that if you put metal in a microwave, it will destroy the microwave. Apparently that's not true. It's just a belief we have. We also believe some things that might turn out to be true, but the whole point is that beliefs are things that we think exist. Uh, values are things that we would like uh, to have happen and that we judge people by as good or bad. Those values are the building blocks of norms which then are a set of rules for how people should behave in society. There can be general norms, or there can be norms associated with certain kinds of people, certain statuses. Uh, and finally, uh, you know, when we think about those behaviors, that's the fourth element. Now, culture can be something that occurs in a non-material way, like a belief. Uh, but those beliefs and those norms and those values get expressed in some kind of physical object. For instance, what's on this paper? Well, there's red pen, right? So who uses red pen? Well, I do. Well, who am I? Uh, who am I? Who do you believe me to be? I, I think you believe me to be a professor. And I'd say, you're right. Uh, how do you know? Well, one of the ways you know is the use of the red pen. Uh, not green, not purple. 
you are graded in red pen. And the red pen is a sign, uh, a symbol for culture. And it's material, so that makes it material culture. Uh, culture has been thought of, to think about it another way, as a toolkit. Imagine that you have uh, um, you know, a nice bag here, right? It might have a hammer in it. It might have a level, might have a little hand saw, and you would use those tools in construction. Maybe it had a wrench, you use it to fix some a leaky pipe. Those are old tools, right? And those are cultural tools, right? They're, they're things that have emerged uh, to take care of things that we believe in or value. But Ann Swidler in 1986 says, you know, think about the toolkit more broadly. What uh, else can we talk about? Uh, we have the... Uh, uh, different tools and that we can pull out in different situations. So I may pull out a certain way of speaking with a cocked eyebrow and the occasional stutter. What does that indicate? Why well, I'm saying something erudite. And I often find myself using this with a cocked head and a tilted eyebrow and a little bit of a, a bit of a stutter. That is a piece in my cultural toolkit. It's not the voice I use when I want my children right now to stop screaming at each other in the back of the car. I pull something else out of my toolkit, which is expressing my understanding of the norm of the situation that we're in and what I expect from my, my children versus what I expect from students uh, in my college course. Very different sets of behavior. Um, all of that is not instinctual, it's not inherited, it's practiced. Uh, you ever see a new parent, you'll know sometimes they don't have uh, the skill set, the cultural skill set down. They don't know what all the tools are for, but they learn it. Uh, sometimes you see a new professor and you won't see them feeling comfortable in their own skin because they don't have the use of the tools down, right? If you want to... Uh, extend that metaphor of the toolkit. You have to learn how to use those tools in order to get by. Similarly, I'm asking you to use a particular cultural toolkit, that of a student. So what do you do if uh, you're not familiar with that culture? What do you do if you are a first generation college student? Your parents didn't go to college. Well, you have to pick it up as you go. You're a cultural stranger, a cultural foreigner, and you're learning that culture is going to be a little bit harder than if you are. Uh, you have a friend who is coming from uh, a family where that culture has been taught from day one from the cradle. That culture, right, you'll notice as we're talking about it, it's something that varies within societies. If we're thinking about first-generation college students knowing the college culture versus other students not knowing it, coming from different places in society, but it also varies across societies. So what we expect college students to do and what we expect uh, college professors to do uh, and what those uh, sometimes the same words mean uh, varies. For instance, uh, in the United Kingdom, if someone says, yes, yes, that's a very interesting idea, uh, and they're a professor, what they may mean is, uh, I think that's a rotten idea, and I'm about to explain to you why. But if you hear a professor say, yes, yes, that's an interesting idea, uh, usually they mean sincerely, oh, that's an interesting idea, and I'm about to go on and on about it, and, 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 and explain a few more things about it, but give you a bit of praise. If you misjudge the culture uh, because you think you're in a different society, the American society with its American culture, UK uh, with its British culture, you'll get in a lot of trouble. You'll get people angry at each other. What's normal and what we understand for one society to be true or valued can be different for another society. Even the whole idea of culture is itself a cultural belief, right? It's this notion of what culture means. Originally, culture referred to this idea of 
something other than nature, right? Something that was created by humans was an aspect of culture versus a rock, okay? Uh, so as Europeans then went out and started exploring a bit more beyond Europe and discovered uh, societies that had, had been there, of course, and they had discovered themselves long before, but Europeans discovered them for themselves. They noticed a lot of cultural differences between different societies. And all of a sudden, that notion of culture became important. And then in the um, 1800s, the 1900s, there was this notion of getting culture. Well, what that meant was that you were getting this intellectual, refined exposure you were getting exposure to a certain kind of culture. When people say, oh, oh, yes, that person has culture, they mean they have a particular sort. What? Of a valued set of people. You want culture. You want that culture. It's, a, it's, it's the good culture. It's the culture of the rich and the powerful. So as we study this diversity uh, as sociologists, we often do a lot of comparative research, uh, comparison across space between different places, comparison across time. Some things to uh, be aware of are first the possibility of ethnocentrism. We often think our own culture is normal and that's just the way things done uh, and often uh, superior. Uh, so we'll think when we look at another culture, that's just wrong. Or, you know, I've never seen anyone do that. We wrinkle our nose, which is an expression of disgust. Notice that when it happens and, and recognize what you're doing. Uh, it's something that I do as well because I'm a human being in society, but I try to notice it. Uh, if we can try to adopt another stance, which is cultural relativism. Uh, Ruth Benedict came up with this idea, and the idea is to say, well, let's if we're going to judge other cultures, let's judge those other cultures on their own terms. Let's try to understand from the inside out what those cultural systems mean, how they were set up, what their logic is. And then we can start to figure out, well, what we think of them. If we don't understand what the logic of that cultural system is, our judgment may not be too well informed. So people who are sociologists of culture spend a lot of time trying to be relative. Okay, um, you saw in your textbook, uh, if you read your textbook for this week, maybe you're about to do it, uh, pictures of goth uh, 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 subcultures, uh, people who wear certain uh, hairstyles, who put certain things on their faces sometimes, who wear certain kinds of clothing. Uh, and you may have recognized that set of people as, oh yeah, that's goth, before you even looked at the caption. Why? These are obvious uh, kinds of groups, okay? Um, beyond that of race or of gender or religion, but uh, obvious in a much smaller way, subcultures that vary from the mainstream, but do so in a really recognizable way. This is where people sometimes make fun of subcultures by saying, oh, they're really non-conformists, but all in the same way. How convenient. That's kind of the idea uh, to, to not conform is, well, how would you go about not conforming? Well, if you're a sociologist, you'll notice that people don't just pull ideas out of thin air they get an idea about how to not conform from somewhere else. Uh, so what it means to be a nonconformist, maybe now you would do it as, as by being goth. Maybe in the 1980s, you do it by wearing safety pins in your clothes uh, and calling yourself punk. Maybe in the 1950s, you'd be doing it by wearing denim, jeans. Wearing jeans was this nonconformist thing that was shocking and appalling at the time. It, it varied from the mainstream, where people would wear chinos and things like that, khakis. So one of the things that happens in diverse societies is that we think about the difference between assimilation and multiculturalism. The idea of multiculturalism is that you can have different um, 
usually social groups that interact with each other and have different cultural standards for how to behave, and they sit right alongside all these other groups. The idea of assimilation is that there's one way to be, one thing to do, and that everybody ought to get with the program. So how do societies best function? Uh, multicultural societies or assimilated societies in which people follow the same set of expectations. That's something uh, that we'll take a look at when we think about uh, systems of racial stratification and ethnic stratification, which is different than race, later in the semester. What is ethnicity? Um, uh, it used to be thought of as bloodlines. But um, an analysis of those bloodlines has shown that they're really leaky. What ethnicity turns out to be is a set of shared cultural practices that tend to be passed down through families, but also through social groups. So sneak peek for later on. Take this multicultural knowledge quiz. This was uh, something for us to look at in class. Uh, but we're going to hold off on doing that in class because it's snowing outside right now. So what I want you to do instead is to think about these phrases and words. I want you to pause the video in a minute, and I want you to write down what you believe the definition of these words are, okay, and or phrases for like getting pinned or jumping the broom. Um, so pause right now and do that for all 15. Okay, good. So you've started back up. Now I want you to pause the video again and go look up the words. How many of them did you get right? Okay, so pause again. And how many did you get right? Now, there are some people who may have a low number. Some people have a high number. Uh, there are people who we sometimes think uh, uh, are, are, are culturally literate, which means that they have been exposed to a number of different cultures. And other people who have only been exposed to uh, a few cultures, a few local cultures. So this is a diagnosis for you. How much multicultural knowledge do you have? It's fun. There's not some idea out there that, that sociologists argue about, uh, which is the idea of a cultural universal. Are there some aspects to our societies um, that are universal? Now, maybe the particulars of how it happens, you know, the particular words we use, uh, maybe, maybe they might be a little different, but maybe there might be some common features to them. Uh, like, for instance, the idea of Papa, Mama, Abba, Ada being common ways of thinking about mother, father uh, for young people. Is that associated, that, that are used by young people, used by babies and toddlers? Is that associated with the first syllables that come out of a baby's mouth? If so, is that a cultural universal? What about language itself? Uh, does every... Uh, Every society we know of have some language? It seems so. Uh, some kind of ritual about marriage uh, seems to be universal. Some kind of notion about what a, a family, although what that is particularly can vary, but a notion of a family, it seems to be universal. Music and art seem to be universal. Um, the particular expressions vary but the existence of those cultural elements is universal. And that's really interesting. And this is the point at which we uh, would then ask ourselves, where, where did the universality come from? Uh, is that something that's biological? Or is it some result of what happens when you take social beings and you put them together? Is it a social creation that is somehow inevitable? That's still a matter of debate. Let's look at UMA culture. Uh, I haven't asked you to do this semester, but in previous semesters, I've asked you to, uh, some students at UMA, to do a little word association. So uh, last semester, I asked students to write down the first word they thought of when the word blue uh, was mentioned. Right? 
And if it hadn't been a snow day, I would have asked you to do this too. Um, but this is the result I got in last semester's class. Sky was clearly the biggest winner. Blue sky and then blue water. Now, now other things are blue too. Sometimes eyes are blue. Sometimes berries are blue. Blueberries, right? It's a big main thing, but people didn't think about that. One person said crip, as in um, the crips is that apparently that's the color of a gang. Uh, blue jeans, right? We wear lots of blue jeans, but that wasn't mentioned as often. Why? Uh, because certain ideas in our cultural set are more uh, centrally associated with other ideas. Blue sky seems to be a big one here. I'll tell you, this is uh, unique to Maine, because if you go to a different place, you'll get a different answer. I used to ask this question as a professor at Duke University. And you know what people said with blue? They said devil, because the Duke University team was the blue devils. Uh, so here we see that across the space, the answer is a little different. What about crime? Uh, when you think about crime, people uh, think about crime you know, in the last semester. Uh, students answer mostly police, bad, murder, jail, prison, and punishment. Uh, murder, interestingly, is described uh, as this highly frequent uh, a word associated with crime, an idea culturally associated. But murder is one of the least common crimes, right? So what is much more common? Theft. Theft is quite a bit more common. Uh, drug use, quite a bit more common. But when we think about crime, or last semester students did at UMA, they mentioned murder most often. Why is that? It's because the idea is much more salient. You look at a crime show on TV, um, how often is it a show about somebody having stolen a VCR from someone and the police go and investigate? It doesn't happen too often. Occasionally there's a show about a big art, you know, uh, robbery or a a jewel heist or something like that. Something really unusual. Again, that doesn't happen very often, right? Uh, but the common theft, the, the regular theft, is not just talked about very often. Car theft is very rarely the subject of a TV show. It's always murder with knives and guns and, you know. Uh, it is culturally highly relevant for us. So when I ask word association, quick, write down the first word that you think of when you think about crime, murder. That has consequences. The consequence is that we tend to uh, believe that murder happens more often than it actually does. And that has further consequences for the way we choose to live our lives. We worry then about our security um, from uh, things like murder more than we worry about our security from things like being in a car accident or getting heart disease. Something to think about. Culture is real if it's real in its impact. What about real, right? I was talking about real. What about real Maine? There's this notion of real Maine. Uh, people will say all the time, ah, that's not real Maine. What do they mean by that? That's not real Maine. Well, I asked people in my uh, intro to sociology class last semester, well, when I say real Maine, what do you think? Lobster <laughs> and lobstermen uh, were, were the big ones. Um, you know, blueberries was kind of down on the list. Uh, and you know, uh, there's no moose in there or chickadees. The chickadees are on the plate, right? But they're not there. Uh, woods is up there. Trees is up there. So uh, what does that mean? Does that mean that if you're not uh, eating lobster or a lobsterman or that you live in Portland, that it's not real Maine? Yeah, well, no one wrote Portland down. Although literally speaking, Portland is really in Maine. Uh, people didn't write Portland down. People wrote, one person wrote down Katahdin, another person wrote down Moosehead, which is kind of sort of nearby. There are these iconic ideas about down east, 
what it means to have real main. Oh, that's the real main there. And then there's the fake main. Okay, we'll talk about that. But we're not the only people to think about real main. Uh, we could think about tweets in real main. One great way to look at culture is to look at Twitter, which is twitter.com, T-W-I-T-T-E-R.com, this microblogging service where people have to express each uh, the, themselves in 140 characters or less. So when you look for the phrase real main, what do you find? I recently looked the, that up, and here's just a stream of what appeared in the tweets. I love seeing a real Maine man walking in downtown Boston. It's like seeing a domesticated wild animal, awkward, sad, and ultimately dangerous. Okay, so that's one person's notion of a real Maine man. There's a notion of a real Maine man, right? So real Maine is applied to man. Then someone said, this struggle's so real, Maine. Then there's a notion of a Maine coon. Uh, okay, and someone says, have a real Maine day. Mm. This life is real, man. For real, man? I swear, I hated her for real, man. And some retweets of that. I played Bureau Battle for real, man, on my desk with Ayobami in Boroughs. Okay, now I'm looking at that and you'll notice my eyebrows are going up because I don't know what those words are referring to. I don't know what Bureau Battle is. Um, I don't know what Ayobami is. Is that a person? I don't know. This is not my culture. Uh, even though I am in Maine, I don't think that person is in Maine. Uh, there's a different way in which some people are using the phrase real Maine. And it seems to be a modification of real man. For real man, except with a different inflection. For real man. Uh, and then we go back to discovering real man goodies at Sweets and Meats in Rockland. Details tomorrow, I hope. So, we can keep looking on in here. Real main wedding of the year contests and some other words I'm not going to say, but they occur. Why am I not going to say it? Because we have a cultural value that some words are not to be spoken aloud. Uh, because if they are, then that gives it a certain reality, a cultural reality that becomes disturbing. But yet, here they are. And they just keep going. A real main story, the farm, and yet there's Portland. What is it? Moo milk. So moo milk is this real main uh, notion where there's milk that's made in Maine and uh, there's a, a cooperative effort of farmers to brand that milk and then we're all supposed to buy that milk to support the real main, okay? Oh, the real main winter hits. Someone wasn't even born in the real Maine. No wonder he's so out of touch. And the struggle is real Maine. Going beyond words, we can see culture in pictures. And we can see it as it applies to gender. So we could ask uh, about ideas of gender. Well, what are men and what are women? Man and woman are these ideas uh, that we give some reality, and when we talk about gender a little bit later in the semester, we'll think about unpacking whether there are such things as real men and real women. There are some people who think that maybe instead of two sexes, there might be five. Uh, there might be more. That's a, a question of our beliefs. What do we believe to be true? And then there's this question of values. Well, given that we think that there are these things called men and women. What should men be and what should they do? What should women be and what should women do? This question of values. Uh, there's a really interesting set of photographs. Uh, when I give credit to Alan Taylor, follow the um, address in this uh, slide 
and you can see a number of them, not just the ones that I'm showing. But what he did was he he found his original 1963 Richard Scarry's best word book ever. This is for young kids, you know, where they learn the words, they look at the picture, and they point at the, you know, the farmer, find the letter, find the barn, find the cow. And you're supposed to learn language that way. And then you get to go to, you know, a great college. And there are changes. So here, you know, it might be a little small for you. This was planned to be put up on a big screen instead of our snow day version. But check it out. So you have um, what some differences. Oh, I see a few differences. So there's a baby carriage in there, if you look, right? Okay. About, uh, you know, in, kind of in the middle. And in the 1963 version, it's being pushed by a woman. In the 1991 version, it's being pushed by a man. Who's riding the tricycle being athletic? It was a boy, now it's a girl. Uh, you had a male man, and now you have a letter carrier. These are words, you might not, they might be too small. The policeman has become a police officer, and the police officer is in a skirt, which is really interesting if we think about that, because how many police officers do you actually see in skirts? But how do you express the idea in a book that a police officer who is a bear is also a woman. How do you express that culturally? Um, that's trying to express something that is really not real, if you think about it, right? A bear, a bipedal bear, and a friendly one, it appears, is a police officer, or used to be called a police man. Uh -huh. Well, there are differences there. Uh, yeah, there are more differences in that picture if you look for them. There are some pictures inside the book that Alan Taylor uh, finds. 1963 version, he, come, he comes promptly when he is called to breakfast. But in 1991, it's an, oh, he's going to the kitchen to eat his breakfast. Uh, no, there's no mention of somebody making the breakfast for him. He's going to go and eat his breakfast, and it's left to our imagination what might happen. Now, in order for this to happen, right, somebody had to look at that 1963 version and go like this, ah, right? Slap upside the head and say to themselves, oh, we can't have that. <laughs> we can't have those words in there anymore. Why? Because they're wrong now, right? Wrong. What's that? That's a value. It's, it's, it's an expression of value, a cultural value, and the values have changed so much. We've got to edit that book because we don't want to have that in there anymore. Uh, same here. Another Alan Taylor picture. Thank you, Alan Taylor. And who's in there? Mother and father. In 1963, mother was in the kitchen. Now father's in there. Mother's mixing things up and father's cooking. This is a statement of value. Okay. Uh, now it's possible, right? You're saying to yourself, oh, well, that's nice. It's cultural progress. Progress. Progress meaning, right, we're moving towards some goal and we're getting there. It's assuming a goal and that there's a direction and we're moving in that direction. And that's just the progress of history and things just get better. And we just, some people might just say, oh, that's just reality now. You know, that you know, men and women both cook in the kitchen together. That's just the way it is. And we're living much, we're real now, you know, in a way that people just back then, they weren't real. They just had this way of doing things that was really kind of inappropriate. Well, I want to challenge that a little bit, and uh, so did Philip Cohen, uh, who is a sociologist at, at the University of Maryland, and he talks about, he has this kind of practice where in his blogs, and you can follow these uh, addresses right here to look at them, he looks at sexual dimorphism in cartoons. What is it, sexual dimorphism? It means, well, sex is um, thinking about uh, men and women. At least we think it is, right? Sex is also a cultural idea. But dimorphism means a split in form. Um, so there are some sexual dimorphisms that have been shown by biologists who exist. Uh, but what does he notice? He notices that some sexual dimorphism really gets 
um, exaggerated more or less over time. So we think about um, gender norms, and remember a norm is a particular kind of cultural element. There's an expectation for behavior. We often think, oh, Snow White, she's all so old fashioned and things. Yeah, and part of that old fashioned is you look at her and you look at the prince. Um, and she's got a little bit of body fat on her, number one. So, uh, and also, if you just let's just look at their hands, they're close to the same size. Okay, not so big a deal, you think? Well, let's see. Here's Belle, she has like negative two percent body fat. And we'll compare, the Bell is from Beauty and the Beast in 1991, the uh, same year as that enlightened uh, Richard Scarry book about gender, right? Look at her hands. She's looking at them. Uh, compare them to the size of her eyes. Her eyes are the same size as her wrist. And then look at Gaston's wrist and his hands. How many of her hands could you fit in his hands? About, you know, like just his wrist. It's like squeaky go six across. And he's even a little behind her. So, right, by perspective, he's a little undersized. So if, it's a big difference. Sexual dimorphism. If we saw these people on the street, we'd get freaked out. And it isn't, you know, until you actually look at particular elements like the eyes. Uh, compare his eyes to her eyes. It's kind of creepy. Uh, compare her eyes to her wrists. It's the size of her lips, the size of his lips. Not yet. I've got fleshy lips, but no one has lips like Gaston over there. Very few people, uh, I would imagine. Look at them on the street. This is unreal. Her jaw, his jaw. Uh, a lot of unreality in there. But it takes us looking at the particular anatomy for us to see the unreality. Why? Because cartoons are not about physical, biological reality, they are about cultural reality, about cultural ideals and values and what we see as an ideal woman and what we see as an ideal man, no matter whether it can be accomplished or not. Look at the size of that bicep. It's bigger than her head. So that's not physically possible, I think, <laughs> right? without some kind of weird augmentation. Um, and yet here it is. And Cohen most recently has posted about, help, my eyeball is bigger than my wrist. This is from Frozen. Uh, it's really recent, right? We're living in these enlightened times. Um, look at her, look at him. Look at the size of their wrists. Okay, now there are size differences in sizes of wrists between people, but do you know anyone who has an eyeball bigger than their wrist? How? Look at the difference in the size of their noses. It's unreal. Absolutely unreal. Uh, in a literal sense. Culturally, it is very real. Something to think about.